we're going to start with a little exercise. I can barely see you, but I want you all to close your eyes and imagine something with me. I want you to imagine the final frontier, a place where no human has ever set foot or eyes on before. Take a couple seconds. All right. Now open your eyes. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you imagined a planet far away from Earth? All right. How about a mountaintop? A few people. How about the ocean? We got an ocean fan. How about deep Earth, right below the Earth's crust? All right. Now, in a world where we're we are bombarded by a lot of really cool images and documentaries and social media about science and space and technology. We sometimes forget how little we actually know about our own little rock in the universe. I am a microbiologist doing a PhD in a field you may or may not have heard of called astrobiology. Now, between you and I, I think that's actually the coolest job in the world. But what does that actually mean? Now. My favorite way of telling people what I do is that we're alien hunters, and that's not because my last name is Alien. But we're not necessarily looking for little green men. Rather, we're looking to understand how life appeared in the universe and where else it can possibly be. So, really, we're looking for the things that appear alien to us. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you think that we are not alone in this universe? Now, I tend to agree with you, but to be honest, I'm not sure I know the answer. But what I can tell you is that life has appeared at least once on a rock billions of years ago. Now, I study a very cool site called the Lost City, and it's mythically named. It's in the middle of nowhere in the Atlantic Ocean, at the bottom between two tectonic plates where they spread apart. If you've seen the documentary Blue Planet 2. Then you've heard Sir David Attenborough describe the majesty of the site. On top of one of the largest undersea mountains in the world, called the Atlantis Massif, these hauntingly beautiful vents rise from the ocean floor, and they release this very clear, very slow, hot, high pH or very alkaline and basic fluids from deep below. The entire vent system is the result of a series of chemical reactions that happen when water comes in contact with rock deep in the Earth's crust. Now, this is an extreme environment. You wouldn't really expect anything to be living there, but when you look under the microscope, you see these really cool bugs that are not only alive but they're thriving. And we're not entirely sure how they're doing that. We think we have an idea. But we know that they're there, and so we've been really trying to understand how they're able to survive in that environment. Now, the Lost City is a window into this very deep biosphere that we are only learning exists in the past couple of years. If you were to take an accounting of all the microbes that exist in the world, only about 10% of them would exist where we are on the surface of the Earth. That 10% includes all the world's oceans, all the world's ice, all the world's fresh water. That leaves about 90% hiding right below our feet. Now, you're going to ask me, what does this have to do with astrobiology, and what does it have to do with the origin of life? Well, here's the part that's really cool to me: those same chemical reactions that are happening at the ocean crust, at Lost City, and other places around the world are actually probably pretty common. And we think they're the chemical reactions that were happening on an early, hostile, really inhospitable Earth nearly four billion years ago. Now that's cool in and of itself. But the even cooler part is these chemical reactions, if they are common, and we think that they are, are probably universal, and they're happening everywhere in the universe where there's water and there's rock. So let's start in our backyard. These are places like Mars. Where we know there's water right below the surface, and we think that there's this type of rock. Europa, a moon of Jupiter, where we know there's an ocean hiding beneath an icy exterior, or Enceladus, where the Cassini probe was able to identify these plumes of water shooting out into deep space, and we haven't even begun to discuss planetoids, dwarf planets, or comets and asteroids. 
These are just the guys in our backyard. By studying the microbes in this weird environment, we are beginning to understand the parameters for life and the limits to them and their minimum needs. And they're really helping us redefine what's normal and what's extreme. If most of the life that is on Earth exists right below our feet, doesn't that make us the weird ones? The other cool part about this is, well, we study an environment that's on Earth. A planet in the solar system where life has appeared once. And the tools and data we generate are the foundation of the instruments and space missions that get launched to Mars and beyond. Because we study a planet where life has existed at least once, in some of the hardest places to get to. This past fall, I sailed on this mighty vessel with a mythical name called the Atlantis. In the midst of the 2018 Atlantic hurricane season, we sailed nine days to get to Lost City, where we spent five days on station. By the way, at one point, we were surrounded by all five hurricanes at the Atlantic at the same time. I don't know whose bright idea was that. But we got there, and we got to spend five days on station doing science for 24 hours a day, where every individual crew member and science team member was carrying out an operational task or an experiment to conclude the mission. We launched a remote submersible you may or may not have heard of called Jason, nearly a kilometer below the waves to get down to the vent site. And the pressure was about 80 times what it was at sea level. To give you a sense of how much that is, that's the equivalent of taking a polar bear's weight and having it rest on an area the size of your thumb. 24 hours a day for five days, we did science operations from a place like this on a boat in the middle of nowhere, where then, after we were done, we sailed nine days back home for a mission that totaled about a month of very grueling but really rewarding work. Now, I look at this picture, and I felt this, and I think, doesn't this feel like a mission to an alien world? See, the truth is, what is happening here, what my colleagues and I are doing all around the world, including colleagues that are on the Atlantis in the Pacific Ocean right this second, is a dress rehearsal for man's leap into the stars. We have more images and videos and posts about space and galaxies and black holes and things that are far beyond our reach than we do of the ocean and in the Earth by orders of magnitude. This is what astrobiology bridges. We, one day, will have astronauts standing on the surface of Mars, maybe yours truly, I don't know. <laughs> and we are going to be using the same tools, the same data, and the same methods that we have been using day in and day out on Earth to probe for life. And we are going to know exactly what to look for, how to look for it, and whether it's life, because we've done so time and time again in some of the most inhospitable, harshest, and hardest to get to environments. I study a site at the bottom of the ocean. My lab mate, Heather Miller, studies volcanoes. My other lab mate, Lindsay Putman, studies continental crust that's really ancient. Others have gone to Antarctica, the North Pole, the bottom of the ocean, deserts, mountaintops, and two of our community members are even part of NASA's new astronaut class. The final frontier begins below our feet. So as an astrobiologist, I think of this question of are we alone? And I remember one day when I was on the bow of the Atlantis and I was staring up at the stars and we hadn't seen an airplane in days and our last ship was like 12 days ago and I was thinking this was the loneliest place in the world. But then I remembered we are surrounded by life everywhere in some of the most extreme environments. And then I think again, life has appeared at least once on a rock floating in space. And by taking that information that we have learned by looking inward, we're going to be able to answer some of the most human questions of are we alone and where else are we going to find life? And trying to uncover that recipe, maybe all you need to do is just add water. Thank you.